Here we go. All right. Okay, so as a reminder, we were in the midst of chapter three. And we did the first bullet here. We learned uh, basically some things about solving on overdetermined systems by looking at the um, pseudo inverse or the normal equations. But now we're going to learn about QR factorization a little bit and determine how we can apply that to these overdetermined systems. So that's section 3.3. First, some definitions um, were went over uh, two vector. I mean, these are probably some, this is kind of like a linear algebra review a little bit, but also a little bit about terminology that the book uses that may or may not be the same as terminology you used to. For example, they call uh, two, two vectors that are orthogonal. That one we all know. Um, if, uh, you know, in this particular inner product we often use, U transpose V is zero, then there's a be orthogonal. In some sense, they're at right angles, right? Um, and if they're orthogonal and also have unit norm, then we say it's orthonormal. And uh, they define this concept in ONC, which I think stands for orthonormal collection, it is a matrix whose columns are orthonormal, well, are an orthonormal collection. So the idea is that um, it could be a rectangular matrix, so it's not going to be uh, an, a, what they normally call an orthonormal matrix because it's not a complete basis set, as it were, right? The, the, if it's a, long, it's a tall rectangular matrix whose columns are orthogonal, that those vectors won't span the entire space of the number of the dimensions that are number of rows in that matrix. So there's a special term for that, orthonormal collection of matrices. So if a matrix is, um, I guess I forgot to put the word ONC here, but probably of an N by K O and C matrix are that it has some of those similar properties that uh, you'd expect, like Q transpose Q is identity matrix, but it's a K by K identity, smaller one, or excuse me, bigger one. Um, well, yeah. And it has the property that when it's applied to any vector, the norm of the matrix applied to a vector is just the norm of the vector. And from that, you can easily get the idea that the uh, matrix norm uh, the one that's implied by that, the, the vector, the inner product is one because any, any unit vector is just gonna be norm one. So those are the probability properties of that. If the matrix is square, then the columns do span the complete space and it's called uh, orthogonal matrix or orthonormal matrix, I've heard it called, but they're using the term orthogonal matrix. So it's important to remember that our orthogonal matrix in this book is an orthonormal matrix. In other words, the columns are not only orthogonal, but they're also normalized. There's a lot of definitions to uh, remember. Uh, let's see some properties of a matrix Q that happens to be an N by N real orthogonal matrix. Oh, I don't know why this formatting got messed up, but that's okay. Um, it's gonna be a little harder to read, but the transpose is just the uh, inverse, which is obvious from that. Um, Q transpose pose is also orthogonal. Um, and this is important, the condition number, which we learned about before, we made, of the matrix is just one, if it's a n by n real orthogonal matrix. So that's a, that's a useful property to remember. Uh, let's see, if A is any other n by n matrix, then the norm of the matrix norm of AQ is just the norm of A, which is similar to this property here. And finally, if U is another orthogonal matrix, then the product of two orthogonal matrices, another n by n orthogonal matrix, and the product of those two will also be orthogonal, and that's less obvious, and I didn't think about how to write that. It might be an exercise, I don't know. So what's the point of all this? Um, the point of all this is to lead us into this idea of orthogonal factorization. So we have to know what the word orthogonal means, or makes sense, I understand why this is important. But it turns out there's a theorem that any M by N matrix, tall matrix, M greater than N, can be written as Q times R, where Q is one of these M by M orthogonal matrices, and R is an M by N upper triangular matrix, right? Okay, so before we go into that um, further, let's just think about what that means because uh, why would we care about that? What this does, R you can think of as saying, okay, each row of each column of A is some linear combination of these orthogonal vectors that are Q, right? So the, fir R, the first in row, R is upper triangular. So the first column of R is just a single number on the top, on the top right, the first element. So it's saying the first column of A is essentially the first column of Q multiplied by some scalar. 
And then the second column of A is some linear combination of the first and second row of Q and so on, working way down. And if you remember your linear algebra, that might remind you of the Grand Schmidt orthogonalization process, because that's exactly what you do when you try in reverse, when you try to uh, orthogonalize a set of vectors, which in this case would be the columns of A. And in fact, that's one way in which you can find the QR decomposition is just to do the Gram Schmidt uh, process on A, and you'll get Q and R that way. And the reason why I bring that up is because this algorithm that they use, well, I'll get to it later. This is the reason why I bring that up. <laughs> so, uh, oh, they also define something called thin QR, which is what usually is returned by algorithms that do this, where um, because most of the because um, it's tall and thin, most of the columns in, in R are going to be actually just zero, <laughs> right? Past, past the first uh, N columns, the rest are just going to be zero. So there's no need to report those. So it just reports R as an N by N upper triangular matrix. And instead of reporting the full square Q, it's the same thing. We don't need the rest of the columns of Q. They never get used. So although Q is a large, a large matrix, it completely spans the entire M-dimensional space. A doesn't. So we don't need all the remaining vectors to uh, to express what A is in terms of Q and R. So this is called the thin QR. So this Julia linear algebra package has built in this QR um, function, which you can call and, for example, get back this matrix. You note that it's not really a matrix. It's this weird object. Um, and that has to do with optimizing this QR for solving um, linear equations. So that's mentioned somewhere in, later in the book. But so that's the matrix Q. These are presumably six by six orthogonal um, orth vectors. These are apparently six six dimensional orthogonal orthonormal vectors. And these last two, I'm going to say the last one here, I guess. Wait, there's six. Okay, there's six. The last two turns out aren't actually even needed for the because this is a six by four matrix. And in fact, we can ask for that, but if we convert the Q to a matrix using the matrix function, Julia, it won't actually give you those last two, it'll just convert it to the thin version for some reason. I, I didn't really dig into why that is, not anyone else did, but that turns out to be the default behavior. I, mean, I, I assume there's some way to get the full Q if you want it. I mean, there it is, but there's some way to turn it into a, just a regular matrix thing. I didn't look in that, but. Any event, uh, let's see. We can verify that Q uh, transpose Q. I never get used to this for transpose. <laughs> I will someday. But Q transpose Q is in fact the yeah, four by four identity matrix as we require. Cool. So why? Why do we care about this? Well, we can try to find the least squared solution to this equation x equals b by substituting this QR factorization of a into the normal equations. It's interesting, you might say, oh, I'll just put QR <laughs> X equals B, and you kind of get like sort of the right answer. <laughs> that's not really what we're doing. We don't actually, there is no X, so that's the X equals B. Uh, we have to use the normal equations here, right? But now we're going to put in for A, QR, right? So A transpose is R transpose, Q transpose. We just substitute it in, right? And then, um, the Q transpose Q is a identity matrix that cancels out, and we're left with this. And then finally, as long as uh, it, they show in the book, or they state, I forget whether they show it or just state it and it's an exercise, but the point is, as long as A is not rank deficient, then we can invert the R here and get rid of these R transpose in front, and finally get this nice little matrix, or this little equation that says that for the least squared solution, this is a property that holds for X, that Rx equals Q transpose B. And now this is something we can solve with our back substitution. If we have the, if we have R and Q, we can just take Q transpose, apply it to B, and then do back substitution, because uh, this is upper triangular, to find the components of X, right? Because R, R times X, this, this right here turns into just uh, a, a set of equations with the bottom one. We, it's just a simple equation. We can just back substitute it back up. You remember how that works from chapter two. We, in fact, in chapter two, we defined a function called back sub. We can just use that and define our own least squared solution thing in this way. We just call QR. We, now we're using the Julia QR. We didn't define that yet, but we're going to call QR and just calculate uh, Q transpose B and then back substitute and we get X. And 
it works. Um, just to check, remember in the last week we had that demo that went weird where with, when we used uh, um, we used the well we used the, when we did with Julia with the normal equation or with when we used the uh, backslash with the normal equation or with just the straight uh, equation ax equals b. It turns out that in both cases the errors are small, so there's something there was some weirdness. But when I use that um, function that we defined back, which I can't remember what it's called now. So anyway, they used the pseudo inverse in some way. Um, it had a big error. Now let's see if this now can get a small error using this factorization. And in fact, it does. So that's, that seems to work well. This is the same. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this. Same thing we did last week, where we, you know, we're used, we're solving a case, we're doing a least squares in a case where it's the exact solution. So we don't expect um, there to be a significant difference between the solution we found and the actual x uh, compared to the size of x. And that's what we see. And it's comparable to the condition times epsilon, right? Condition matrix. OK, so that's that. Um, now we're at the end of section 3.3. I'm just going to do a quick, I actually, I'm not going to run this. I'll just talk through because um, it's not that terribly interesting to rerun it in, in the, to my mind anyway. In Julia, but this is exercise. So this goes back to 3.12, which I didn't do. But just to real quickly go through, all it is is the uh, this is the data. It's uh, population data as a function of time, and the, the goal here is to fit this to a cubic polynomial. And um, so we set up the matrix here. I forgot what it's called now. <laughs> anyway, the uh, what's that called? It starts with a V. The Vandermond. That's it, the Vandermond matrix for this. And we just pass that matrix in with the counts to our least square factorization thingy to find the matrix, the coefficient matrix, which it calls, you know, previously called X, we're gonna call C, just not to be too confused by it. And these are the coefficients. Um, the fact that this coefficient is so big tells me I probably should have done some normalization of the data first, but for this case, it doesn't matter because um, linear algebra doesn't care. But if we were doing some kind of numerical thing, that would probably cause problems. Anyway, we are doing a numerical thing, but I mean, if we are doing something um, more complicated, it might cause problems. So we can just show that the polynomial line fits right. You know, this is the kind of neat thing. You can just define a function based on those coefficients with one line. <laughs> I like that a lot. And then just plot it right on top of the, uh, using plot bang, right on top of the data and it worked great. Just for fun, they told us to predict the population in 2020 and we predict 340 million almost. The actual was 331 million. Um, it's a little bit off, but this didn't take into account um, many things are going on in 2020, I guess. I don't I actually didn't check to see if that's reasonable within the errors of you know how well this fits the line. I probably should have done that, but we can look and we see that probably is though, because some of these points don't fit that well on a scale of you know couples of millions, maybe. Yeah. So it's not terrible. Okay, so do you want to take over for a minute and do the other exercise? Yeah. Right, let me see if I can remember how to stop sharing. Here it is. Do. Okay. It wasn't too complicated, but I tried to do it without like searching and just using the book. And I finally got <laughs> Julia called to work. Um, so the question was to create a grid. Um, from on minus one to one. And then we have this Vandermond matrix A um, with degree less than five, find the QR factorization and then plot on a single graph every column of Q of the thin Q. So I created, this is creating the grid of points using the range function. And then I did the Vandermond matrix with the I don't know what you call this notation, but. Uh, list comprehension, I think. Yeah. Or just so comprehension, it, I think, in Julia. Yeah, OK. Yeah, so every t to the jth power from 0 to less than 5, which is 4. <laughs> um, then I just use these functions you talked about to get the thinned q. And then um, this is kind of small, but I can share. Let me just share my whole desktop. 
essentially it's the same lin you know to the zero power linear quadratic cubic mm -hmm. quartic but the scale right so we know that the thin q they're orthonormal columns so right Yes, that's yes. right. So we have the scaling here. Um, different than the original A. Cool. Yeah, so it wasn't too interesting. I mean, complicated. Right. But yeah, I got my Julia call to work. I had to copy a file because it was look I don't know if this happened to you it was looking for this I can't remember what it's called die lib I know there was some problem I forgot what it was, so. yeah so first I had to give it the right path and then I had to copy a file yeah, this. So my file was actually called 1.1 point dilib and the Julia call looks for oh, one point. So I had to just, someone online just said, okay, yeah, just make half copy was just yeah. to copy it. <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, I'm not sure I like working with Julia call. I mean, it's good for like, if you're writing documentation or something, but I think for like experimentation it's not that great because you don't have like a, you don't have a terminal or so exactly. you know, like an interactive shell to work with Julia at the same time and, and the rest. And like so, you said, every you time if you render, you have the startup. Yeah. Well, that I can't avoid, but at least I can, get, I think I can get a better interactive experience if I, went, if I used the notebooks or something. I might use the notebooks for the next time I have to do it. Yeah. And I think I can render the IPI and VTs to, um, To R Markdown or to QMD using Quarto, I believe you can, I can reverse that. I'm gonna try that so that I can work with the, the notebook and then convert it. Uh, yeah, and, and the rendering, but we'll see. <laughs> and then shove it back into the in the book. And I guess the yeah, the only other thing was I when I put it in Quarto, I had to put a semicolon after all the plot yes, I found that too, yeah. <laughs> lines, or else it was yeah. like increment. Yeah, same thing in our markdown too, which I'm right now in our this is actually being in this is actually in our markdown what I'm using right now because it's supposed to go in the book eventually as soon as I, I like it, turn yeah. off all the executables and yeah. All right, let me go back to sharing again. If I can find the button. I always have trouble finding this stupid thing here. It is. It's probably when you use like different systems all the time, like some some of my meetings are using teams which i can't stand but then i get used to that and i forget how to use zoom so it's always fun <laughs> okay so this is where we were now the next section uh, is about how to compute how to compute these qr factorizations and now as i said before you can do this with the graham schmidt process which i try to make um, clear by just thinking of what qr is when you multiply q orthogonal matrix times r you have a triangle what it's actually doing is just computing A from linear combinations of the orthogonal, um, orthonormal vectors in Q. Now this section of the book goes through how to do this in a very mechanical way using these householder reflections. And I don't know about you, but I had a heck of a time keeping this in my head going through this, trying to think about what it's doing. It went, the book goes through pretty carefully at, um, an example of this. So I just gonna say that, hey, it's basically doing Graham Schmidt, but Mechanically, that's my my synopsis of that section of the book. I do want to call out these household reflections on, by themselves because they I think they might come up in handy for other things. And basically, what it is is it's a vect a matrix is a form of identity matrix, and you subtract off two VV transpose. So what it does is it it takes um, the component of whatever vector you're, you're applying P to, right? Finds the component of that with uh, along the V direction and then multiplies it by V again, and it takes two times that. So that what that ends up doing is reflecting that component of X across, across the, uh, the V, uh, the hyperplane that has a normal vector V. That's, and that's the picture they show in the book. Um, 
it's not totally obvious to me why that works. So why that's useful for um, well, it's, you can kind of see how that would be useful in doing the Gram Schmidt because you need to subtract out the parts of the vector um, that you already have from the new vector to get it orthogonal, right? That's basically what you're trying to do. Remember in the Gram Schmidt, you start with the one vector that you normalize that, then you say, okay, this next vector, I need to take away the parts that are parallel to that first vector, so it's orthogonal to that vector, and you continue along that process. So I kind of get that, but I really had a hard time following this uh, whole process through. Um, but essentially, they said, look, if we have a, a vector z. We can choose some v so that p reflects z onto the e1 axis, where e1 is our first orthonormal vector that we're using. This is just like the first step, right? And so and the vector that can do that is this vector, which they described, like I said, show how, how you find that detail. But if you just plug this in, you'll see that it does, in fact, work. But this vector does that job. And, but I, like I said, I don't, I don't tend to go through that whole process because I don't know how I can explain it because I don't think I fully understand, <laughs> which I apologize for. But <laughs> I think if I were to sit down and really work through it, I might understand it. But I only have so much bandwidth to go around. So. But the book does describe the process in detail. And I think the essence of the idea is to use this um, vector P to successfully turn the matrix A into R, right? And then the orthogonal projection matrices themselves form that uh, matrix Q. That's my quick summary of <laughs> that. Uh, if you need more, good luck. <laughs> Just kidding. Hopefully, <laughs> there's no quiz, so we don't have to that. Um, one last comment that the book makes is that when you do um, uh, the, the least squares, you only need to actually compute Q transpose B, so you don't need the full Q. Right. And that leads to this so-called Qless factorization. And Julia uh, captures that with that strange type that returns that Q or compact W, Y, Q that we uh, uh, showed before. And that object contains more information to help it efficiently calculate this Q transpose B, essentially. And I don't know what that information is, but. The kind of talks on the book, if you look through the algorithm, it says, oh, it just saves the parts from this step and this step. And I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> I believe you. Okay, so this is one other exercise I looked at quickly. And that was, hey, let's see if we understand at least the householder reflector part. So we want to find a householder reflector such that we could take P, multiply by this particular vector, and get this uh, vector that is similar to what we were trying to do for the first step in the QR factorization, where it only has um, a number in the first element. Only the first element of this vector is non-zero, right? So just to make sure this is kind of back, this in a in the household reflector equation, we need this 11 to be the norm of this vector. And I just checked and see if that is in fact the case. Uh, enter that vector and check the norm, it's 11. Okay, fine. So then we can just apply 3.42 uh, or E1 is this 100. Just calculate W, right? Which is the norm of Z times E1 minus Z. And then normalize W to get V. That's the, the process that's spelled out in that um, theorem. We can just, this is kind of cool. You can basically just write out exactly what, this is interesting um, because you just put I here <laughs> and it knows from the rest of the equation from the generic methods that it, it defines what I has to be. Like it knows from the dimensions of this that I has to be in this dimension, which is kind of neat, I think. So you can just write this out like a nice little mathematical equation on how to define some of your I need, you know, certain size identity matrix. And we can verify that, yep, there we go. It's within air, within uh, machine precision of uh, 11, zero, zero. So uh, that was the rest of the chapter. The whole chapter probably would have taken an entire hour, but we, I think it's a good idea. Maybe we get an early break today um, and, um, it's resync for next time, right? Actually, next time we're on a on a break, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks so much. And yeah, I agree that the the I, it's nice <laughs> you can just yeah. type that. Um. Yeah. So next week I'm out of town, so we'll meet. Right. That was the reason. Okay. Weeks, and I will start chapter four. Excellent. Okay, I hope that was helpful. I apologize for not finding a nice simple way to explain that QR factorization. Did you guys? Grok that completely? Probably you did, right? <laughs> so I had to take a linear models class, like a PhD level class. Oh, so okay. we had to do all of that by hand, I remember. 
like all those Graham Schmidt things. So I've done the Graham Schmidt. It's just a, a, I've done that by hand too many times, but it's it, uh, it seemed familiar. But doing way. it with the householder matrices and all that, I've never done it that way. I don't know if I did. Yeah. I, but I feel like I remember a P. Yeah. But maybe it was just something. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, what about you, Andrew? Uh, I, I I didn't really had time to go through the chapter, so uh, I have to go through it again. But uh, we didn't do it by hand, but we sort of like, um, at least when I got exposed to it, we the instructor, at least the TA at that time, uh, did the demo in R. So it's like uh, an oh, okay. experience to, for you to learn R at the same time, mm. like that uh but at that point they were more interested in projection matrices because again this linear models kind of stuff uh right. you, you see that uh showing up uh cool uh, yeah. as 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 for the next me the next meeting is uh on the 20 on 27th right yes Okay, and then uh, on the 11th, I might not be available. So that's something that I just want to let you know. Uh, okay, we can yeah. decide. Yeah. If it's just going to be the three of us. We should just skip if one of us is not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think this is going to increase but <laughs> the size of the group. <laughs> no, and I think it, it does make the book go a little smoother we do have a little even, even, long time excuse but it's good to have a little breaks because this book is pretty intense so it's mm -hmm. not really a break it just gives an extra week to read the chapter and understand yeah. it. <laughs> which is nice <laughs> yeah and ron i think you're doing six right chapter six is that the ods the ode thing yeah, yeah. then then i'll do five after torin yeah so torin you'll do four right yeah mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then at, at least we're halfway, more or less. On here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that many chapters, but they are very dense. That's why we have to split it up, I think, like we did, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think once you, I, I had a look at four, and uh, I think it's, it's possible to do it in one go but uh maybe one and a half sessions or so oh okay yeah, okay. yeah. we can finagle the schedule yeah <laughs> yeah when it comes Just time me. yeah cool yeah the 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 harder ones will be the next few ones like i, I don't even know what cree love or cry love method <laughs> are so yeah. nope yeah, so th those will be particularly challenging. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it will be fun. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. All Great. right. Thanks, guys. Right. Thanks, you know. for Thanks, everyone. Okay. See you in two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Have a Take good care. one. Bye bye.